says, And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself. It's okay right there. He forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, we can be in church tonight. We thank you for the fellowship with thy people. It's always good to assemble with the saints, come out from among the world and assemble together. Lord, where we have things in common, we can have true fellowship. We can enjoy one another's company. Lord, we can come in here and there's nothing negative. It's all just a blessing. Lord, we appreciate the fellowship. Now, Lord, we appreciate the good singing, the good congregational singing, the specials. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. Now, Lord, without it, we'd be in a mess. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, we're thankful for the promises contained therein that, God, we can anchor our soul to. Lord, we're glad that it's forever settled in heaven. And Lord, we're glad we can come tonight and we can glean from your truths. And Lord, we're thankful for, in the Old Testament, it was written for our ensamples. Lord, we can see how you moved in the past and how you dealt with men in the past. And God, we know man didn't write the Bible because, Lord, you reveal everything. The good parts, the bad parts, you reveal the traits of man. And Lord, we realize the Word of God's our schoolmaster. Brought us to the knowledge of sin. But Lord, we realize where we stood with thee. We were at enmity with thee until that wonderful day when we heard the gospel. And the sweet Holy Spirit of God convicted us of sin. We was able to trust you as Lord and Savior. Lord, we're able to come out on this Wednesday night, Lord, and worship you. Uh, Lord, we realize many of your people have worked hard, been on the road, they've faced adversity, had to live in this old wicked world, and God, but they've found themselves in the house of God tonight. I pray that you would help them, you would touch them, you would bless them, you would certainly send revival these days to our hearts. I do pray for Miss Marcy. It has a big surgery coming up. And God, you'd be with her. We know you won't forsake her. And God, we just pray you would give the surgeons and the nurses and the doctors the wisdom to be able to care for her properly. And I pray that she'd have a full recovery according to thy will, Father. I pray for Miss Fedora the same. You'd help her on her surgery Friday. I pray for those that are sick. I pray for little Samantha tonight. And those that are sick, Miss Sonny and others. I pray that you would touch them and help them. I pray for those that are traveling, you'd give them traveling mercies. Uh, but for the next few minutes, I pray you'd put a hedge about us tonight. And I pray that you would enlighten our minds to truth. I pray you'd challenge our hearts. And I pray you'd get glory from uh, this service tonight. Lord, if there's anybody here tonight, unsaved, lost without God, I pray tonight would be the night of their salvation. Use this unworthy vessel now, Father. Glorify your name. We'll bless you for it. For it's in the wonderful and holy and glorious name of the Lord Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Amen. I want to draw your attention to several things from this chapter. I want you to notice, first of all, the forsaking. We find in verse number 1 that Rehoboam, who is the son of Solomon, he has followed in his father's footsteps, but not young Solomon's footsteps, old man Solomon's footsteps, old man Solomon's footsteps who took strange wives and forsook the Lord and offered up sacrifice unto Baal and even offered up children to Molech. Uh, we find that Rehoboam is following in his father's footsteps. Uh, he has taken strange wives. His wife of his greatest love is an Ammonitess, uh, and uh, he has taken uh, uh, strange wives, and he is trying to uh, uh, surpass uh, even his father's fame, although that will not happen. But notice he forsakes the law of the Lord in verse number 1. Uh, look, if you will, down in verse 14. It said, And he did evil uh, 
because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Uh, my dear friends, if we're going to learn anything from the Word of God, uh, we need to realize that every day we need to prepare our hearts for the things of God, uh, or else we too will follow the sin nature, uh, the corrupt nature, this flesh, uh, and we too are capable of transgressing against God uh, and doing evil in his sight. We see that he forsook the Lord. We see the forsaking, but not only that, this is very important. Notice the following. Look again at verse number 1. He strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord, and all Israel with him. Friend, when you go bad, you never go alone. There's always somebody watching you, and people will follow you. Hmm? It's amazing you can spend a lifetime trying to get people to come to church and accept the Lord, and they won't. But you go bad, and they'll follow you wherever you go. Hmm? Can I say they followed, all Israel followed him. When Peter decided he was going fishing, you find the other disciples went with him. Hmm? It's a dangerous thing, my dear friends, to follow the wrong leadership. We find the following we find the forsaking notice if you will the fallout look in verse number two it came to pass that in the fifth year of king rehoboam shishak king of the of egypt came up against jerusalem because they transgressed against the lord with 1200 chariots and three score thousand horsemen and the people were without number that came with him out of egypt uh, the lubiums uh, and the sukims uh, and the ethiopians uh, and he took the fenced cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. Can I say, you don't sin and win. There was a fallout. We find that he is confronted by a great army out of Egypt. We find the king is Shishak. And can I say that any time you find the Egypt in the Bible, it's always a picture or type of the world. When you forsake the Lord and you follow after wrong counsel, uh, the first thing that is going to affect you is the world. Next thing you know, you'll be doing worldly things. You'll listen to worldly things. You'll follow after worldly things. Uh, uh, you'll get to where you look worldly. Uh, 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 you'll think worldly. Uh, uh, all of a sudden, the things of the world make sense, and the things of God seems archaic. I don't know how many people I've seen leave a fundamental Baptist church, and all of a sudden their standards get lower. All of a sudden, their music's different. Uh, all of a sudden, their dress is different. Their speech is different. Uh, their thought process is different. Uh, next thing you know, they're changing the Word of God. Uh, next thing you know, they're going to uh, 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 something that don't even resemble church, and they're pleased with that. Uh, we see the first thing they confront, they confront with is the world, Egypt, Shishak. But notice there's also some others. Those that came out with e out of Egypt with them are the Lubians. We know those as the Libyans. Can I say the Lubians? If you look at what that that name actually means, it means the dry lands. When you forsake the Lord and follow false leadership, and you end up worldly, you'll get dry. I've seen some folks that once had a shout to them, once had a glow to them, once had a, 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 an air of holiness about them. But they forsake the Lord, and they get dry. They just smile, their face would crack. Hmm? Can I say there's nothing worse than getting dry when you've tasted the fountain of living waters? Hmm? But not only the Lubims, we find the Sukims. That crowd was known as cave dwellers. Hmm? Matter of fact, uh, they're Iranians. You know why we were in Afghanistan and Iranians so long? Because they dig shelter in deep caves. That's why we had to drop Moab over there. But that's a whole other story. But those cave dwellers dwell in darkness. Can I say, friends, when you walk away from the Lord, you'll not only get dry, but you're subject, uh, becoming subject to darkness. You see, if we walk in the light as He's in the light, we have fellowship with the Lord. But you walk away from Him, there is no light. 
dark days ahead. And then the Ethiopians. And uh, I know people are going to comment about this, but Ethiopian simply means burnt people. Now, Brother Sammy will tell you that we're brothers from another mother, but he cooked longer than me. He'll tell you that. That's what he tells. I didn't say that. He says it. Yeah. He said, I come out too soon. Yeah. That's what he said. But could I say that you not only will become dry and face dark times, but you'll get burnt out. There are so many people who used to have the joy of the Lord, and now they're just so burnt out on life. Life has gotten too big for them. The pressures of life is too much for them. Uh, 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 they got to take medicine to go to sleep, got to take medicine to wake up, got to take medicine to function throughout the day because they can't handle it. Uh, and the reason why is their heart's not right with the Lord. Uh, we see the fallout. But notice the finding, if you will. Look at verse 5. Then came Shem Shemaiah, the prophet, thank God for a man of God, to Rehoboam, to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord. Can I say, somebody that's out of the will of God, the best thing they can do is hear from God. The word of God will never lead you astray. He said, Thus saith the Lord. Ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. Now notice the rebuke. We find that the man of God, the prophet, tells them, Ye have forsaken me, thus saith the Lord, Ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak? We see the rebuke. Now I know all you Joe Osteen lovers think that preaching is to make you feel good. A sermon is not to make you feel good, it is to make you do good. Hmm? Teaching imparts information, but preaching requires a decision. We find a rebuke. But notice also the repentance, verse number 6, whereupon the princes of Israel, the king, humbled themselves and said, The Lord is righteous. What a blessing. They heard the message, they received the message, uh, and they repented. They humbled themselves, uh, and they proclaimed that the Lord, he's righteous. Uh, and then notice the reprieve in verse number 7. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves... The word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. What a blessing. The reprieve was they weren't destroyed. It's a terrible thing if you ever forsake the Lord, but thanks be unto God, He's long-suffering. Thanks be unto God, he has mercy. Thanks be unto God, he has forgiveness. Uh, and what a blessing, they humbled themselves and got right with the Lord, and the Lord sent a reprieve. But then notice the fine. Can I say this? Sin does not come without cost. I said it before, you cannot sin and win. There is a consequence for our choices. And God will forgive us of our sin, but friends, you still got to bear those scars. Notice, if you will, the consequence or the fine for their sin. Look at verse number 9. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took all. He carried away the shields of gold which Solomon had made. I mean, he came and he cleaned house. Israel stayed a sovereign nation. Rehoboam stayed king. But they lost the most precious things. Can I say, my dear friends, listen to me, parents, you better be careful not to forsake the Lord. 
It might cost you your children. Hmm? You say, preacher, does that mean my, the Lord's going to kill my children? No, they just might end up not getting back out of the world. You lead them to the world, they might stay there. I preached a message one time on don't bury your children in Moab. Hmm? Can I say, my dear friends, that thing that is so dear to you, the Lord does know how to get your attention. Hmm? I'm interested tonight, there is a great contrast. Look again at verse number 9. At the end it said, He took all, he carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made, Look at verse 10. Instead of which King Rehoboam made shields of brass and committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard that kept the entrance of the king's house. And when the king entered into the house of the Lord, the guard came and fetched them and brought them again into the guard chamber. Now, I don't have a whole lot of time to get bogged down on this, but when Solomon built the temple, it was in David's heart to build the temple. God wouldn't allow David to build it because David was a man of war. He was a man of bloody hands. But God told uh, David that he'd allow his son to build the house of God. Uh, and David was the one who amassed all the materials. Uh, and Solomon took uh, uh, the seven years to build the temple. Uh, and uh, uh, as far as everything I've read, there's never been an edifice ever built to the beauty of Solomon's temple. Uh, uh, and one of the things that Solomon did, uh, uh, he had 300 guardsmen uh, that every time Solomon would enter into the temple, the house of God, uh, those guardsmen would come out uh, and they'd stand at arms with shields that were overlaid with pure gold. Uh, and they said the beauty of Solomon in his royal apparel, uh, uh, walking into the house of God in the sunlight, uh, hitting those shields, uh, they said it was nothing less and majestic, it was royalty at its best, uh, and uh, uh, it did something to all those that came and saw it. Uh, they said there was nothing like it. Uh, he had those shields of gold, uh, but Shishak takes the shields of gold. The Rabon replaces them with shields of brass. Now notice, if you will, the, con uh, uh, the contrast. Shields of gold represent redemption. Shields of gold represents righteousness. Everywhere you find gold in the Old Testament, it's a picture of righteousness. You can't have righteousness without redemption. God saves us, so what a blessing we got saved, washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, forgiven of all sin. Uh, then the Lord robes us in His righteousness. Uh, hey, what a blessing. Uh, I'm robed in the righteousness of God. Uh, my name's written down in the Lamb's book of life. Uh, my citizenship's already in heaven. Uh, my conversation is recorded there. Uh, I've been made joint heirs to the throne of Christ. Uh, nothing but, uh, but, but for, for anything that I have done uh, or all I brought to God uh, was a sin-tattered garment. Uh, I brought nothing. Uh, I could not save myself. Uh, I was lost on my way to hell. Uh, but somebody told me about Jesus, uh, how He died for my sins, uh, how He was buried according to the Scriptures and rose again according to the Scriptures, uh, how He saved me from my sins. Uh, hey, I didn't have, Brother Brian, enough sense but to put my faith and trust uh, in what thus saith the Lord. Uh, and I'll never forget uh, that third Saturday night of March in 1974 uh, at an old-fashioned altar. Uh, I went down a center, uh, came up saved by the good grace of God. Uh, I've been saved ever since. Uh, I'm on my way to heaven. I say, blessed be the Lord. Uh, and he robed me in his righteousness. Uh, but can I say those shields of gold also represents reverence Solomon did not build that temple so the name of it would give Solomon glory. It was built for the glory of God. And when Solomon and those entered that wonderful sanctuary, when they had their hearts right, they went to worship and reverence Almighty God. I don't know why you came out tonight, but if it wasn't for to worship and reverence the Lord, you're here for the wrong reason. Can I say, those shields of gold represent privilege. And Brother Moore, when he prayed, said, this is a privilege. There's not a one of us worth the powder it take to blow away, let alone worth 
getting to come to the sanctuary of God. It's a privilege. It's an honor to assemble with God's people. Now, I know the world looks at us and thinks that we're all crazy. They think, Brother Tommy, we're part of a cult. They think whatever they want to. But the Lord said we are of a royal priesthood of a chosen generation. Uh, we are not of the rudiments of this world. Uh, uh, my dear friends, you look around, you're seeing the cream of the crop. Uh, this is God's people. Uh, and what a privilege to be able to be counted amongst God's people. Uh, it's a privilege. But it also represents position. We have a position in Christ Jesus. What a blessing that I'm in Him and He's in me. What a blessing to be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The only thing, Brother Ron, keeping us from heaven is this flesh. But he looks at us as if we're already there. Now, I don't understand all that, but I'm seated in him in heaven while I'm here. Huh? What a blessing. What a position to be in. That'll help some of you get out of the mully grubs when you realize this is as close to hell as you're ever going to get. It represents privilege. It represents position, but it also represents power. There is power in Jesus' name. There is power in the sweet Holy Spirit of God that indwells every believer. And there's power in prayer. And there is power to overcome in this life through the Word of God, through the Spirit of God, and in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's what all that represents. But let's, let's look at the contrast. Shields of gold are gone. I shudder to say this, but you know me, I say it anyway. I've known a lot of churches that once stood for the truth that at best they're museums tonight. They don't have the touch of God on them anymore. They've lost their shields of gold. Sunday down at Brother J.D.'s, we had a good time. And boy, he had some singers. He had a bluegrass group. Say amen, Brother Phil. He had a bluegrass group. All right. They were so good, even Miss Annette liked them. She's not a bluegrass fan. But, but, I'm, but I'm telling you, they not only sang, as a family, they not only sang, but I mean, they picked, they, them young boys picking banjos and dobro. I didn't know you could get that kind of sound of a dobro. This boy picked the strings off of it. They got what we would call some snow flurries. I mean, it didn't even amount to much, even... They had about as much snow as you got hair on top of your head. You know what I'm saying? Now, you ask Miss Nett, we passed 14 churches that closed. I don't know, but Brother Phil, I'd, I'd shudder to think that they probably didn't have a shield of gold anyway. Because most of them, when you drove by them, you can tell by what's on their sign. You can tell by some of the things they've got around the building. It didn't look like they had too much inside to offer anyway. And I say there's a lot of churches that have lost their shield of gold. A lot of preachers that have lost their shields of gold. A lot of Christians have lost their shields of gold. And they're wanting to replace it with shields of brass. Well, what, what, what's shields of brass? Well, shields of brass give a defined verdict. Anytime you find brass in the Bible, it's always a picture of judgment. You know why they didn't have the shields of gold? Because judgment fell on them because they forsook the Lord. Now, they're trying to give the appearance that they're what they used to be but they have a defined verdict against them, judgment. Can I say that that shield of brass also has a decreased value? I don't know about you, but I'd rather have gold in my pocket than brass. I want brass in my gun, 
gold in my wallet. Hmm? It decreased the value. Was it worth what that shield of gold was worth? Can I say people are watering down the gospel? It's not worth what I believed in. Are you listening? They're watering down the Bible. They're watering down preaching. They're watering down services. They're watering down things, uh, and they don't hold the same value to the Lord uh, or to God's people. And can I say, they also have a demeaning validation. The validation they have is it's a substitute. It's not real. Now listen, I don't like instant mashed potatoes. I like real mashed potatoes. I don't like instant gravy. I like real gravy. I don't like processed chicken. I want real chicken. Huh? I don't want Arby's. I want Roy Rogers. There's a difference in roast beef. Anybody that remembers Roy Rogers knows there's a difference. Huh? Hey, listen. I don't want chip beef. I want ribeye steak. Are you listening? I want the real thing. When it comes to the things of God, I don't want smoke. I want the fire. Are you listening? I don't want something that somebody has to come up with to appeal to my intellect. I want something that challenges my heart, something that confirms something in my heart, something that brings conviction to my soul, something that uh, 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 exalts the Lord Jesus Christ and not mankind. Many churches, many Christians, many preachers are satisfied with shields of brass. This one I want to preach on. Just got a few points. I want to preach on embracing the substitute. A lot of folks are embracing the substitute. And can I say this, Brother Sammy? There's a lot of folks that say the right thing, but they don't have anything behind it. Hmm? Brother Moore, you know that. You've been around long enough. There's a lot of people who shake your hand and tell you one thing, but there's no power behind it. There's no substance behind it. I don't want the substitute. And I'm sure not going to embrace it. Uh, listen, those that are embracing the substitute, they do it for several reasons. First of all, they do it for contempt. They have a disdain for the real thing. They're constantly wanting to correct the Word of God. They're constantly wanting to throw us off as this old-fashioned, archaic uh, believers. Uh, 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 we need to get with the hip thing, the modern thing. We need to uh, uh, get to where we arrive. Uh, 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 I can't stand folks that uh, uh, they do this with their glasses. They look down their nose. Oh, you're one of them. Yes, I am. Thanks, thanks be unto God. Huh? Uh, listen, they view church as only a set of rules. Mm. What, a, what a sad, sad commentary. Uh, I, I, did, I didn't come to church tonight because I had to keep a bunch of rules. I came to church tonight to hear about Jesus. It's not a set of rules. And I know, I know church, I know independent Baptists, boy, they'll give you a set of rules when you walk in the door. You've got to adhere to these, huh? Well, we do have a rule book. And we have a lawgiver. His name's the Holy Ghost. And he teaches, he leads us and guides us into all truth. Uh, but he don't beat me over the head with it. He grows me in it. What a blessing, huh? They look at church as a system uh, uh, of relics. Hmm? I'll never forget, Brother Rod brought me an advertisement uh, several years ago. I still got it somewhere. Had this real mod-looking gal on there. Looked like she come from the 70s. Had on some of them uh, uh, white maxi boots, they used to call them, and a mod haircut and all this stuff, and said, uh, uh, we're not your grandmother's church. So I got up and preached the message on what's wrong with your grandmother's church. Grandma knew how to pray. Grandma knew how to worship. Grandma loved God, huh? Grandma knew them old songs and what they meant. Uh, 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 Grandma might have not uh, knew everything about theology, but she knew the God of the book. And what a blessing, huh? Uh, can I say they view church as a bunch of self-righteous people? Now, trust me, I know some self-righteous people. 
but I know God's people too. And what a blessing for folks that haven't forgot where God found them. And they embrace the substitute because of contempt. But not only that, because of convenience. Hmm? They just blow in when it's convenient, blow out. Hmm? You know, it doesn't mean anything to them. Do you know why uh, public housing doesn't work? Because those that live there didn't have to pay anything to get there. It's all provided for them. And so they have no stake in it, so they tear it up and don't care. If you're paying for it, you take care of it. Hmm? But can I say the same thing with church? If, you just, if it's just convenient for you, and you don't take ownership, this is my church, and I'm going to get involved, and I'm going to take part. If you don't have any ownership, my dear friends, it don't mean anything to you. One writer said it this way. True Blood said this. He said, either you're part of the working crew or you're just on the passengers list. I thought that was pretty good. Uh, there's a lot of people just long for the ride. Uh, I want to be involved. I want, I, I, want, I want to, you know, just see what the Lord's going to do. I want to take part. I, I don't have much to offer him, but if there's anything in my life he can use, I want to take part. I want to be involved in something God's are doing. huh? They not only embrace the substitute out of contempt and convenience, but a lot of them do it out of complacency. And this is what is killing our churches. People are self-satisfied. Their bills are paid. They're driving what they want to drive. They live where they want to live. They got to everything they think they need. They got food in the cupboard. They got a little pocket change. They think they're okay. And they don't realize that all God's got to do is cut off their stash. And it'll be a whole different, different situation. They become self-satisfied. Listen, those that are complacent, they don't mind the gold. They just don't want the gold. Let me say it again. They don't mind the gold. They don't care how much Phil shouts their lungs out. They just don't want the gold. I'm just satisfied right where I'm at. That's why we don't have revivals. Why a true revival hadn't come to America in over 100 years. Because we don't want it bad enough to have it. Complacent. Revelation 3 is in the book for a reason. I'm increased with goods and need of nothing. The Lord said, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Can I say? Others embrace the substitute because of compromise. Not compromise in the way I mentioned a minute ago about compromising the Bible and their standard. No, they compromise in their priorities. I read this story about a church that was in a building campaign and they needed $75,000 to finish the, the, the building project. They was going to do an educational building. And uh, one of the deacons got up and gave an, you know, an inspiring address how they needed to raise that money. And then the preacher got up and he preached on will a man rob God? Well at the end they took up an offering and the treasurers came out and reported that they had exceeded the $75,000 goal. The place abrupted in applause. There was a standing ovation. They was excited. They met the goal. The very next Sunday, same church, an eight-year-old boy walked an aisle and trusted Christ as Lord and Savior. There was no applause. There was no standing ovation. And I read, Brother Ron, that only a handful of people came up to even congratulate the young man at the end of the service. See, they've compromised. We put more emphasis on the building than we do souls. Put more emphasis on ministry than we do souls. Uh, without uh, uh, seeking to see people saved, there is no ministry. Uh, Jesus came seeking to save that which was lost. Uh, uh, the main priority of the church is to get the gospel out, my dear friends. Uh, we lose sight of that. It's all sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. And some embrace the shield because of compromise. 
Brother Clint, they don't mind if you get the gospel out. Just don't ask them to get the gospel out. Miss mm -mm. Noreen, they don't mind if you go over to the jail, the ladies' jail service. Just don't ask them to go. Uh, Brother Ron, they don't mind if you get up, preach, or teach a class. Just don't ask them to do it. They embrace the substitute. Some people embrace the substitute because of control. They will not yield their will to the will of God. Hmm? There are some people just control freaks. It is a great day in your life when you realize you can let him have it. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. Hmm? I, I really meant that I wasn't worried about whatever's going on in my, my life physically. I mean, the Lord's got it, so why, should, why do I need to worry about it? I, I really do believe what I preach. I'm in His hand. His hand's in the Father's hand. Nothing can come to me unless it goes through His hand, and He never allow anything to come to my life that it's not meant there to either correct me or better me, my dear friends. I've just learned to trust Him. Hmm? I've been telling you all for years I was old. Some of you figured it out. But I meant when I said last year, when I told you, I told Miss Annette, I thought I had 20 years left in me. I hope the Lord comes back for then. Huh? But I know a lot of preachers my age looking for a getting off place. I'm looking to get more involved. Are you listening? But there's some people, they won't give up control. It's not their ideal. If they're not the you know, leading the thing, the head of the thing, they're not interested. The last thing that causes people to embrace the substitute, Brother Sammy, is they have a counterfeit salvation. They don't know the Lord. They don't know any different. Amen. They're being religious. Friend, all religion does is bring damnation. Jesus brings salvation. Salvation is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a religion. Huh? Uh, I'm not religious, Brother Brian. I'm not a man of the cloth. I just hope to get up and be a man sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm not religious. I'm saved. Uh, but listen, so many people are trying to be saved instead of just accepting the Lord and becoming saved. Hmm? They're trying to figure it out in their mind what they have to do to be saved. Brother Ron, wouldn't you like to have a dollar for everybody that's told you they've been baptized? Their trust is in religion, baptism. I've had them tell me, well, I'm a member of such and such church, and I'll just ask a question, well, who's the pastor there now? They never know. Yeah. Well, you must not be a faithful member if you don't even know the pastor's name. Hmm? Uh, religious. Some think come to church, Brother Ray. What's going to get them in? And some people have the mindset, Brother Jacob, that when they die, God's going to weigh all their good points and all their bad points, and if the good outweighs the bad, they get to go to heaven. Well, I, got, I can answer that right now. There's none that, that's good, none that do it good. No, not one. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Come to church won't save you. Come to church might just make you mad. I don't know. If you're not saved, I don't know how long you can come to church, huh? But listen, there's a lot of people who got a counterfeit salvation. They think they're okay. They shook a preacher's hand. Brother Ray, they've never learned that nobody, nobody, nobody ever cared for them like Jesus. Yeah, right. Amen. You ever fall in love with Jesus, you won't want a shield of brass. Right. You'll want a shield of gold so you can represent him because of the great love he loved you with. You want to love him back. And you know, that's all the Lord really requires from us is to just love him. And he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And he's easy to love because he's altogether lovely. Yeah. Even Pilate, when he tried, he said, I, I find no fault in him. And you won't find any fault in him either. Some of you might have a bad habit of looking around. You need to start looking up. And you'll find true love. Some, Brother James, unfortunately, they don't know anything about that song you sung, Amazing Grace. They got a counterfeit salvation. 
And the sad thing is they think they're okay. That's why we need to have the power of God on us. That's why our church needs to have the Spirit of God moving in such a way that He can convict them and show them, remove the blinders from their eyes and show them they're trusted in a counterfeit. Let me ask you a question. Look again. Verse number 9. Shishak, he took all. He carried away the shields of gold which Solomon had made. Now look at the first word in verse 10 instead of which King Rabon made shields of brass. The instead is the embracing, the substitute. Let me ask you a question. What are you embracing tonight? The real thing or substitute? Did you come tonight to see him high and lifted up or did you come out of obligation? Do you have revival burning in your heart or has that flame started to fall off a little bit it's just a flicker now night might be a good night to ask the Lord to help you to settle for nothing less than him and his righteousness and let him do work in your heart and you can shine for him brighter than any shield of gold ever could in Solomon's name one greater than Solomon's here his name's Jesus are you shining for him? Don't embrace the substitute when you can have the real thing. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. I tell you what, Brother Clint, uh, other Brother Clint, come sing that prodigal son song I like so much. Come sing that song. If God's speaking to your heart tonight, the altar's open. Maybe tonight you want to come and just tell him you love him. Maybe tonight you want to come and just thank him. That you've got the truth. Do you know how many people have never heard the truth? Maybe tonight you want to come and pray for somebody. The altar's open. They're getting that song ready. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for your good grace. Now help us, Lord, to never sat settle or be satisfied with anything less than you and your righteousness. Bless now in this invitation. Use my feeble efforts and, Lord, to... Then I tried to convey the thought you put in my heart. Use it now, the Spirit of God, to deal with hearts. And certainly, God, if anybody's not saved, I pray tonight be the night of their salvation. Bless now in Jesus' name. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.